Okay, hi, this is Peter Rogers, MD, uh, with YouTube channel, same name, and I'm interviewing world and Olympic champion Mark Schultz, uh, three-time NCAA champion wrestler, also a UFC champion. How you doing, Since Mark? And my gymnastics. <laughs> <laughs> and state champion of California in gymnastics. Yeah, yeah I'm doing good. Uh, I, all you folks out there that don't know Pete Rogers... I was his coach when he was at Stanford. And uh, there was a, a time where Pete was asked to relinquish his scholarship to make his scholarship available to someone else. And the coach forced him to give a speech in front of the whole team. And after that speech, I got really angry because I knew the potential that Pete had and I got pissed because he was, uh, I could tell this was not right, what was happening. And so I took him under my wing and we went and worked out. And I said, you got to wrestle for different reasons. You got to wrestle to learn how to fight, not to win for Stanford or for the coach. And you got to get out of that dorm you're in, which is full of, you know, academics, but none of them are athletes and you got to get around athletes. So you moved into the Delta Tau Delta house and uh, associated with athletes and you kept your scholarship and became the winningest wrestler in Stanford history. And you were student athlete of the year. And then you went on to write straight A's at Stanford and on to Harvard and uh, how to cure back pain. <laughs> which I have in my book right now. Anyway, that's who Pete Rogers is. And uh, he became uh, the, an, an incredible doctor, had the highest biochemistry score in the history of Harvard entrance exams. I mean, this, this guy's a genius. This He's like the Einstein of whatever. Anyway, he turned himself into a genius. So now well, the audience knows who you are, Pete. I almost dropped out of Stanford. Mark Schultz saved me. I was ready to quit. The head coach didn't like me. He tried to make me give up my scholarship. And Mark just said, you come train with me. You hang around with wrestlers. You need to think like a wrestler. And he started telling me all stories about all the Russians, about wrestling the Russians, about uh, about Gene Mills, when he had to wrestle Shigayev, defending world champ. And everybody was you know, worried about the match. And Mills said, I'm going to kick the shit out of Shigayev. <laughs> and it kind of... Just being around you, I got my confidence sort of came back as an athlete, and I just kept getting better, and it was uh, that was really good. Yeah, that was the best coaching experience of my life up to that point, and even after that point. I mean, there, you know, to me, I was just in it to, for myself until I met you, and that gave me a reason to to share my knowledge with someone else because you know it's very difficult for me to share knowledge because it's so difficult to go through the thousands and thousands of wrestling moves that you have to you you have to you have to to learn and the only way to learn is by trial and error and i had got about you know seven or eight moves that worked against everybody in the world and i wasn't about to share that knowledge with anybody but <laughs> you gave me a reason to share that knowledge with somebody and then yeah, the other thing too i would say that really helped me was the idea of the intensity of purpose because a lot of the wrestlers at stanford kind of had an attitude well wrestling is fun it keeps us in shape it's kind of like a hobby and um that's not good enough at the college level at the college level you would say pete this guy's your worst enemy in the world. He's trying to beat you up and embarrass you in front of his friends, <laughs> in front of your friends. <laughs> you know, so, and it's true. And getting all psyched up, that really helped. And then also when you're talking about dominating at the world level, I'm like, well, gosh, the least I could do is, you know, win conference. You know? <laughs> so it's a, it's a good yeah. motivator. Yeah. And you won conference. Yeah. I, well, we, I, you know, I don't know for sure if I even did win conference, but I won several matches at NCAs. And like I said, I was undefeated in dual meets. I beat a couple all Americans. My, my ability like more than doubled after I started hanging around with you. So I wish, I wish I'd talked to you my first day of freshman year. I was scared to talk to you guys until after the sophomore season. It was kind of like, 
You guys are coaching the senior guys. I mean, I started on varsity as a freshman, but, you know, I was kind of back and forth with injuries and stuff. I wasn't fully into it, and I was afraid I was going to flunk out of school. So, like I said, if I had talked to you guys right in the beginning, I would have been so much better off. But, you know, I didn't know. Yeah, and I I didn't know either. I mean, I, I didn't I didn't really talk to anybody. I wasn't really into coaching for, you know, because I wanted to teach kids how to, how to wrestle. I was in it to – to train for the Olympics and the world championships. And, you know, and it just, I never, I never had a reason to, to share my knowledge or help anybody else out except myself. And that's a very selfish way to live, but yeah, but you know, when, right, when, when you you're going for an Olympic that. title, you gotta be selfish. I mean, um, you right. know what else you reminded me of? You reminded me of uh, Walter Payton. He was the running back for the Chicago bears in the sense that he had said something similar to you. He said, you know, before a big competition coming up, he likes to be very silent. If you're silent for a prolonged amount of time, it somehow enables you when the time is right to step in and take the upper edge, the upper hand, if you will. Um, and you would be quiet sometimes for a week or two weeks before a big match to the point where it was almost scary and you would wear sunglasses so nobody could tell what you were thinking. And you were you were like the most intimidating guy in the whole United States. <laughs> yeah. And uh we we had a we had a lot of fun together uh, going around to the different frats trying to get beer from them, but uh, I won't talk about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have I have some funny pictures from that one night where those guys threw that junk off the roof of the of the fraternity house. It was kind of funny. My father came by like the next day and he's like, Peter, you know this this is a disgrace. You don't have to live here. I'll give you money. You can move somewhere else. You don't have to live here. I'm like, Dad, I love it. This is this is my favorite place I've ever been since I've been here at Stanford. Yeah, yeah I met John Elway in that house. Yeah. Yeah, that, he's a member. That's the uh, athlete frat. It was the best place. Yeah. The best place on the whole campus. Yeah, it's the only place athletes could, you know, feel at home, I felt. I mean, I never even saw that place before. I didn't even know that place existed. And then... I think you found it, or maybe Dave Lee found it. I don't know. I, I think I knew about it before. I don't know if I did before you did or not, but that was definitely the place to go to get out of that mindset that yeah. all the other students had. I mean, they're all valedictorians, but they don't know what it's like. Nobody knows what it's like to wrestle until you Yeah, done. Stanford's a really wimpy place. It's very hard to maintain a tough mentality. That's why we used to always listen to heavy metal music. I used to read Conan the Barbarian com comic books, just something to get my mentality right for wrestling. And then hanging around with you and your brother. Um, that's the thing I needed too. Um, you know, and then, you know, the same thing too was in practice, Porpel didn't let you and Dave talk enough. So he would show us all this stuff that worked for him, but didn't work for anybody else. Uh, but anyways, how's that's everything? How are things going? That was okay with me because I didn't want to show anybody anything that, you know, I didn't want to give away my secrets so he can talk all he wants. But you gave me a you, you gave me an outlet to teach. And finally, I mean, that was probably the first time I ever taught anybody anything. Yeah, everybody so. was pretty much scared of you. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a fact. <laughs> well... Uh, I, I remember telling you, you know, you're not, you're not wrestling to win tournaments or championships or titles. You're in it to learn how to beat the shit out of people. That's the reason I wrestled. And that's, I don't know. I just felt like, you know, what good is, is, you know, a sport unless it has some real life application. Well, wrestling's got a real life application. It's a martial art. Well, it's a foundation for martial arts. It's, it's a sport, but it's the best foundation for martial arts. I mean, if you look at the UFC champions now, uh, more I think 28 are 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 have their main uh, foundation as wrestling, and like 17 have jujitsu, and then boxing and kickboxing are down the down the list, you know, somewhere. But wrestling and jujitsu, or you know, wrestling's on top, and Jiu-Jitsu is right underneath that. And uh, I got your brother Mark into Jiu-Jitsu. You know, oh, yeah, he did really good because he stayed in shape and he kept training and he became a world champion. You know what else happened to him? When he was in college, everybody thought he'd be an All-American. He was state champion, freestyle and Greco-Roman in high school. 
but he was a bit of a disappointment in college, never was an all American. And I think the reason was it turns out later when he's around 40, he became a vegetarian and he markedly reduced his salt intake and his endurance uh, dramatically improved at that point. So he had a salt induced uh, exercise asthma. Salt can make the immune system hyper reactive and that would make him get tired uh, in the third period. And, you know, the guys from Iowa would just wear him down and beat him. But once he got his energy back, he became, I think he's like a three-time world champion now. And um, I think it's Brazilian jiu-jitsu or something. Yes, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. <laughs> yeah, I wish yeah. I continued. But, you know, I work all the time. I, I, yeah, I yeah, I... yeah. No, don't worry about that. That What you're doing is you're saving lives, actually. So you need yeah. to. Yeah. I try to help people as best I can. I'll tell you what's the funny thing in medicine, though. In, you know, there's acute disease where you really help people. They come in with an obvious cause, fall down, you know, fracture, bone broke, must fix. But most patients have chronic disease. And the, the reality of the situation is there's no money in teaching them how to get better. The money is keep them on pills or operate on them. Yeah. Um, so... I think people would really benefit by you telling that story of how you got fat and then learned about nutrition and uh, you created the Spartan vegan diet and now you're all skinny and healthy and your blood pressure is really low. I think people should know about that. I don't know if you want to tell them about that on the on this podcast for free, but you, you oh know. no, it's it's all for free. I do the whole thing for free. I kind of have fun with it. It's a creative outlet. It only takes like part of my IQ to do conventional medicine. On this one, I'm able to sort of challenge myself intellectually. Basically, you know, I was like the best biochemistry student in the entire United States. And we're told that nutrition is bundled into that. But then I'm in my mid thirties and I'm fat, early to mid thirties and I'm fat. And I'm like, holy crap, how did this happen? I was working like a maniac. I was trying to do two fellowships simultaneously. I authored a textbook that year, had a baby at home with the wife. I was working super long hours. So anyways, but I got fat and I figured, well, no big deal. I'll just exercise more and eat less. I can lose this weight. Plus my father had coronary artery disease, was considering open heart surgery. My mother was dying of cancer. And I'm like, if I'm such a great doctor and I know all the stuff that you know I'm supposed to know, how come my father has heart disease? He could die from this. My mother's dying of cancer and I'm a big fat. So I'm, I'm, I'm about five, nine in height and I weigh 220 pounds. I'm like, some, either, either medicine sucks or I'm doing something wrong. And so then my family was all mocking me, you know, hey, fatso, and, you know, you're going to be impotent soon, diabetic soon. And my wife's like, oh, my life will get easier. And I'm like, you know what, this is ridiculous. So I said, I, I got to figure this out. So I began to read intensely. All of my energy and focus centered then on understanding nutrition and disease causation. And what I found out was all of the textbooks are wrong. They're all kind of a joke. And I, right I'm not there. kidding. That, read about nobody knows this in the whole world. Nobody knows this. Yeah. In, in coronary artery disease, all the books will say, you know, you need a stent. And if you can't stent, then do a bypass. Maybe try some medications, a statin and some aspirin. Okay, but that's nonsense. In the comparison with the Esselstyn diet, he has 198 patients in a row. Cured. Cured. No more problems. Okay? There's Essel nothing remotely like that. His name's Esselstyn, right? Yeah, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, his book is Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. And I, I went and trained with him as well. And what I'm saying is there was chapter after chapter where that came up. You know, I read about autoimmune disease. And in the big chapter from the Harvard textbook, the one I used to admire, okay? And then I now I read it and it's a joke. There's no mention of autoimmune mechanisms like leaky gut, you know, or, or, or there's a couple other mechanisms I could go into. None of the relevant mechanisms are in the standard textbook. And this is a 2000 page book. It's not like there's not enough room to fit it in there. They're not in there. The, I have the current up-to-date version, the one that's considered the standard. It's not in there. Same thing with hypertension. You know what they do for hypertension? They go, oh, 90, 95% of hypertension is essential hypertension, meaning that the cause is unknown. That's all bullshit. Oh, yeah, I noticed that too. You know, whenever doctors give, you know, you're trying to look up something on the internet and they always say, well, the this this hasn't been this may not be you know proven yet this may not be they, they use like the word may and may not you know just to try to like they, they try to they try to muddy the waters you know so that you never really get a grasp on what you need to do to get healthy and i think you're the first guy i've seen that has 
decided to learn about all the things they didn't teach you in medical school about how to prevent disease, how to stay healthy and live longer and have more energy. People don't, doctors don't tell you how to do that. But this uh, diet and lifestyle that you're, the Spartan vegan diet, that definitely increases energy and it lowers your fat. It, it makes you live longer. It prevents disease. And I, people, I think people would be surprised just how easy it is. I mean, it's hard to do, but it's simple. It's like wrestling. Wrestling is the hardest thing there is. It's simple, but it's not easy. Yeah, and a big part of it is they got to unlearn all the stuff they've heard in the past. The thing that gets promoted most of the time is the Mediterranean diet, but the Mediterranean diet is a joke. I call it the antichrist of diets. The reason is it promises to save you, but it doesn't work at all. It's a big joke. It doesn't forbid anything. People are, you know, guzzling down olive oil. It allows alcohol. It allows chicken and fish, nuts and seeds, all these high fat foods and avocados. Those just plug up arteries. You need to be very low in fat. That's a, one of the key things about preventing atherosclerosis. Low in fat and low in sodium. That's And then a high in potassium, that's how you prevent hypertension. The, the Mediterranean diet does not address those essential things and therefore it doesn't work. No, why don't you explain what the blue zones are? Yeah, there's a guy by the name of Dan Butner with National Geographic and they looked at the 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 data from around the world what are like the five healthiest populations where the people live the longest in their 90s and hundreds and that they're still healthy and they're still mentally sharp and they, then they looked at what did they have in common only one of them was in america that was the loma linda seven uh, which is a suburb of los angeles in california and the seventh day Adventists. it's part of their religion to be a plant-based diet okay so it's religious rather than health-based but they're still remarkably healthy especially they're vegans um, then it was also the Okinawans, which is sort of in southern Japan, and it's kind of like what Hawaii is to America. That's what Okinawa is to Japan. And back in the early part of the 1900s, they ate primarily sweet potatoes, and they also ate, you know, rice and local foods. And they had incredible longevity. They were second to the Seventh Day Adventists and the longest lived lives when they ate those old fashioned diets. Lots of them were farmers. They didn't have a car. They would walk out to their farm property and stuff. Um, then there's another one in Icaria. I think that's with Greece um, and gosh, I know one's in Costa Rica and then I forget the other one, uh, but Italy? is it Italy? Yes. Sardinia. That's it. Sardinia. I think that's right by Italy. So anyways, what they all had in common was they ate 95% or more plant-based foods. Um, nowadays, Butner will say, oh, 90% or more, but he used to say 95%. And so that's what I think is funny too. They're all other than Loma Linda, Los Angeles suburb, they're all kind of, you know, backward. Okay. They're rural people. A lot of them are illiterate. So that's, what's funny. All these Americans, you know, oh, I got to join a health club and all this fancy stuff. No, just eat the plant foods that grow outside that humans have been eating for thousands of years, walk around and keep busy in the day and you'll be healthy. Yeah. Not only that, but your, um, Oh, what is it? Your dental plate, or what do they call that? The in the mouth it narrows when you're not eating the right foods, and these primitive, primordial humans, their their mouth is a lot wider, and they're they're they don't get cavities, and they're just much healthier. And what? Is, yeah, what there's, is there's a guy who wrote about that. His name was Winston Weston Price. And he was a dentist in the 1920s and 30s. He traveled around the world looking at all these populations. And the ones that were eating their old-fashioned diets, they all would have close to zero, if any, cavities, good, strong teeth. And then, like, if one person in their family went and started working in the city and started eating, you know, refined bread, refined flour and sweets um, and all the modern processed food, they would get tons of cavities. So, And you're right. They'd also get a deformity of their mouth. Their, their jaw would not be formed normally. They kind of have this mouth breather narrow look to their mouth to their faces their face looks a little funny it's it's abnormally narrow at the bottom right and uh, you know the the prime people that lived in the primordial eras never had any of that because they didn't have all this manufactured food isn't it true that pretty much every food that's manufactured is bad for you yeah they're all bad the only exception that i would eat would be if there's a single ingredient and that would be plain oatmeal and quinoa or quinoa um, which is pretty much like oatmeal. Those are the only ones. 
and I would only eat those with water. Once you get into a second ingredient, they're allowed to put MSG in there, monosodium glutamate, which is a mild neurotoxin. So I would not eat anything with that in there. Um, yeah, so I don't eat any processed food. That's I call it a whole food, plant food diet. Right, and, the, and, and eating the food as a whole unit is part of the key, right? Yeah, and look at our teeth, okay? When you look at your teeth, our teeth are flat. If you if you go into your brows and you type in teeth of a horse, look at your teeth, they're flat. The reason is flat teeth are for grinding plants. Uh, also our jaw, it goes side to side. That is characteristic of a plant eater, a herbivore. If you were walking down a path in the forest and you saw a dead deer on the ground, you know, the flies buzzing around, you would say to yourself, it's kind of disgusting, okay? You don't get this immediate feeling i got to get down on my knees and take a bite out of it your mouth couldn't even pierce its hide okay on the other hand if we put a bowl of fruit out on the table you would salivate we're made for that right that's the uh optimal human diet is plants right yeah i think we i think that's the reason why we got color vision so we can see when fruits are ripe. that's normal um Right. And those colors are because of the different chemicals in each, like the grapes are purple because of the, the chemical. What's the, I, I yeah, yeah, you're right. It's the antioxidants. The antioxidants in the different colorful fruits, they give off characteristic colors like, you know, beta carotene, orange with carrots. And like you're saying with the grapes, you can get a purple or a green. Right. So you want to, you should pretty much just Keep your shopping limited to the produce section if you want to live long, stay healthy, and lose weight, have more energy, right? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I'd say there's basically three foods that I recommend to eat. Number one is your starches, and that usually should be the main number of your of your calories, about 50 to 80 percent. And that includes things like rice, beans, potatoes, sweet potatoes, uh, quinoa, oatmeal. Those are great supplies of, of energy to starches. So starch is just a polymer of glucose and it's all wrapped in fiber. I used to include corn in that and wheat, but there's so many GMO variants on that that I would stay away from those two foods because they, they get too complicated. Um, then the next category of foods is the fruits. And fruits are great. I love fruits. Um, the catch with fruits though is they're, they're more expensive. Um, unless they're frozen, they don't store as long. So they're a little bit more troublesome to, to acquire on a frequent basis. They don't satisfy hunger quite as well as starch, but they're good. And I mean, if you're lucky enough to live somewhere kind of semi-tropical, like Texas or Hawaii or South California or something where they're where it's hotter all year, they're more widely available or Florida or something. But for a lot of people living up north, it, you know, it's going to cost you a lot of money to eat fruits that much other than, you know, you can freeze stuff, you know, frozen blueberries are great food. Um, then the next thing is vegetables, but vegetables only need to be about five to 10% of your calories. 5% is fine. You know, it's probably a good idea to eat at least one salad a day. If you're, if you're trying to heal something, I would say eat two salads a day. They, it's got a lot of greens. They also have nitrates, precursors to forming nitric oxide. The back of your tongue has bacteria on it that convert the nitrates, uh, to nitric oxide. And then actually the stomach acid also facilitates that conversion to nitric oxide. Um, and that leads to total body systemic vasodilation, improved blood flow. So a uh, polymer of glucose, you mean like, it's just like a giant clump of glucose is what that right. means. Right. So it starts as a whole bunch of glucose molecules, one after another, you know, a string of them. And then they're all wrapped in fiber. So this is a great thing because it's low caloric density, your stomach is stretched by not that many calories. Early satisfaction of hunger is from the stretching of the stomach. Then the food goes into your gut and it has to peel off that fiber before the glucose can be absorbed into your blood. And that process of slowly peeling off the fiber creates the effect of a slow release energy pill. So um, your blood glucose stays normal a prolonged amount of time. You satisfy your hunger and maintain your blood glucose level for the most prolonged amount of time with the fewest calories. So it's very efficient and it, it prevents you from getting fat. It gives you lots of energy. It's like, what more could you want? Um, if you look at, look at the, look at the Asians. Okay. China before 1975, when they used to eat about 85, 90% of the calories from rice, a billion out of a billion are skinny, no diabetes, no hypertension, no autoimmune disease, close to nothing for cancer. Um, it makes people healthy. Same thing, Papua New Guinea, they used to eat 93% of their calories from sweet potatoes. They're all skinny and strong. Okay. 
Starches make a population skinny and strong and energetic. So why don't you tell the people what do you mean by leaking gut or leaky gut? Yeah, basically there's two types of gut bacteria. You're going to hear all this stuff, the gut microbiome, almost all these videos on YouTube, they're stupid. They, they just confuse you. They don't tell you what the point is. There are two types of gut microbiome. There's the good one and the bad one. The good one comes from eating fiber. The good, the fiber feeds your gut bacteria and they take that fiber and they convert it into what are called short chain fatty acids. The most important one has four carbons. That's butyrate. You can think about, you know, your alkanes. If you're thinking about chemistry, butane is a four carbon alkane. You put a carboxylic acid on it. Now you got a four carbon carboxylic acid. Okay. So that's butyric acid. You can also call it butyrate. And the point is, that is what is used by the gut lining cells to maintain tight junctions. The gut's called the enteric tract. So the cells that line the gut are called the enterocytes. And they need to have be tight between each other so that nothing leaks in between them. If they don't get the butyric acid, they'll start to leak. And what that means is bigger chunks of food and even entire bacteria, bacterial endotoxins can get across that space between the enterocytes because of lack of tight junction. That's called leaky gut. And the relevance is normally you should not absorb anything more than three amino acids strung together. They call that a tripeptide. So a bond between two amino acids is a peptide bond. So two amino acids would be dipeptide, three amino acids would be tripeptide. And if you absorb more than a tripeptide, let's say a big chunk of protein, your immune system will recognize it as foreign and form antibodies to it. And then what happens is the an amino acid sequence of a protein from another animal is relatively similar to your own, but it's slightly different. So you'll form antibodies to it, and then it'll mimic proteins inside your body. And so that's called molecular mimicry. And those antibodies will then cross react with your own bodily proteins. So molecular mimicry with autoantibody cross reactivity. And so what that means is because of the foreign material getting in and your immune system attacking it, your immune system becomes confused. And now it travels all over the body. And these antibodies start attacking your own body. Like a typical example would be, let's say you eat a hot dog and there's ground up animal thyroid in that hot dog. And then you got leaky gut. It gets into your blood. Your immune system's like, what the hell is this? Attack, attack, attack. And they're like, hey. And then, then they travel around the body. And they're like, hey, this looks like the same thing. And they attack your own thyroid. And there you go. You, you screwed. You lose your thyroid. Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Okay. And it'll do that to other parts of your body. In the brain, multiple sclerosis. Okay. In the pancreas, in a baby, in a young kid, type 1 diabetes, uh, especially associated with dairy. Okay. People don't realize that dairy is kind of dangerous, especially, you know, in kids. Yeah, I mean, dairy is, uh, you know, it's uh, it's formula to create gigantic animals out of these little calves. And it's here we are, human beings, you know, drinking their milk. It's not natural for one species to be drinking the milk of another species, right? Yeah, there's no species that drinks the milk of another species. The, the, the amino acid composition is quite different from human milk. The protein content is quite different. It's really not a good idea. I mean, if you have to give formula, because so many women work nowadays, you can use a hypoallergenic form. But you know, the best thing, the best thing is breast milk by far. Uh best thing is formulas. Oh, breast milk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, soy bad. soy oh. formula is even worse. <laughs> what is uh, oh what? Is soy mean? formula is even worse for, for babies. Oh wow. So okay. Well, uh, the point of all of this is to live healthier with more energy, with longer, and prevent disease. And you mentioned a doctor named Esselstein, who I heard has a 100% uh, cure rate for his patients. Isn't that, is that right? Yeah, if the patients follow his diet, they all get better. You know, any patients, he said that the ones that didn't follow his diet, they don't get better. But as far as I'm aware, the ones who actually do follow the diet get better. You know, I heard about one potential case report of a patient who claims to not have got better. So I haven't I haven't looked into that in more detail. But what I'm trying to say is 198 patients in a row. There's nothing like that in any other aspect of treating chronic disease. There's nothing like it, um, except for when you see people go on this low fat, low sodium, whole food, vegan diet. You know, and that means no, no meat, no dairy, no, no meat, not one bite, no oil, not one drop. Okay. Um, that's how you get healthy. And a lot of people go, oh, well, that's too strict. 
why are you so strict? And my, what I, my response is, because that's what works. The way to think is, you know, think like a championship athlete. I must train every day. I must push myself harder. That's how you should think about your health. Not like a typical wimpy, stupid person. Everything in moderation. You know, no. When in, you know, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. You know, that type of, that's social thinking. You know, when you go to a party at a new place, fine. But when it comes to health, you want to think biblical. Thou shalt not eat meat. Thou shalt not eat oil. Because that's what works. Okay, I don't have any animal rights. I don't care about any of that stuff. I just want to be healthy. I want to keep the Johnson working. I want to keep the brain working. I want the heart working. And that's what you got to do. You got to keep the arteries open. Yes. So uh, it's it's simple, but it's not easy. That's why you call it the Spartan diet, vegan diet. You got to be kind of like the Spartans. You got to be like a warrior. You got to be like an athlete. Or like a soldier. You got to stick to the discipline to stay within the, that body.